In arguably the most delicious dose of irony we will ever have in our lives, the Houston Astros say they've been cheated. Meanwhile, the Kings make a trade that hints strongly at a bigger one that's coming down the pipe, and a former Chargers running back blames Sean McVay for his current contract problems. Good morning. I'm James. This is your daily dose of sports and snark for the greatest sports city of the world, Los Angeles. This is the Faithful Angelino's Morning Report. So it is June 25th, 2023. I am back home with the wife. She's lovely. I'm happy. Happy about the wife. Honestly, happier about what happened in Chavez Ravine last night. Come, drink with me from the chalice of irony over how tone deaf the Houston Astros are. We will get to more of that in just a moment. But if you like being in the know about LA sports, clickety-clack the like button. Clickety-clack the subscribe button. There's a notification bell. Hit that. It'll let you know when we drop new content. Sharing is caring. Let people know we exist. And by all means, comment. It is a glorious Sunday. Let's get at it. Before we go through the news and notes, a look at the scoreboard. Three Dodgers hit home runs yesterday, but that was not the key. Ryan Stanek balked in the game-winning run in the eighth inning, and the Dodgers defeated the Houston Astros 8-7, which made him oh so upset because he believes that the umpires screwed him over. That's rich. Meanwhile, the Galaxy in Colorado, there's a rapid recap of that match, but honestly, 0-0 tie. Not a lot of fun out there for either side. LA has had three consecutive draws, but they are 10 points behind the last playoff spot in the MLS Western Conference. Meanwhile, Vancouver 3, LAFC 2. Tough times for the black and gold, but Dennis Buonga and Carlos Vela scored. Meanwhile, today at 4 o'clock, Houston is looking to avoid getting swept by the Dodgers. Tony Gonsolin takes the mound for the LA. He's 4-2 uh, and two with a 2.92 ERA. Hunter Brown is 6-4 and four with a 3.78 ERA. And Dallas is playing the Sparks. That game will take place at noon. Um, so here's my main point. Because we all know what happened back in 2017. And we all know how nobody in Houston wanted to apologize for a damn thing over how they cheated the Dodgers out of an entire world championship back in 2017. And we're not forgetting it. So when a relief pitcher with a Leonard Skinner-esque haircut flips out, goes ballistic over having balked in the winning run and how he thinks he was screwed, oh, that's just delicious. That's like the best plate of ribs you've ever had in your life, where the meat is just falling off the bone and the sauce is just chef's kiss. I wanted plate after plate of the irony that the Houston Astros could not stop screaming about. Now, um, Static gets thrown out of the game, and hopefully when he got thrown out, he was thrown all the way to a fantastic Sam's so he can get that ugly ass hair taken care of once and for all. But if you are in Houston and you are complaining about fair play, let me be a help, a help to you, okay? Because according to Dave Roberts, by the letter of the law, it was a bulk. Now, I get it. The bulk rule can be a little opaque, but let me help you. CBS Sports listed 13 ways that you could commit a bulk. Number one, you could start a pitching motion without completing the pitch. Number two, you could fake a throw to first base. Number three, while standing on the rubber, you can throw to a base without stepping directly toward a base. That's a bulk too. What about making a quick pitch, which is too, called illegal, or pitching while not facing the batter. You see, there's a lot of ways, many ways. 13 ways, as a matter of fact, that you could commit a balk. So, sorry, your team has lousy haircuts, your team has even worse ethics. 
The reason you guys lost was not getting screwed by the by the umpires or Major League Baseball. You guys allowed three home runs to Dodger batters. You guys blew a 7-3 lead after the sixth inning. So don't come crying to us. You screwed everybody else over, not just LA, but everybody in the playoff run of 2017. You are the last people to complain anything ever about getting screwed by Major League Baseball. So that felt like a lot of fun. Duh, down with Major League Baseball. They're trying to cheat us. Get the hell out of here. Complete lack of self-awareness. Complete lack of self-awareness. Also with Dodgers news, Julio Arias is scheduled to make a rehab start with Rancho Cucamonga today. The Kings have traded right-handed defenseman Sean Dursey for Arizona, to Arizona for a second-round draft pick in next year's NHL draft. And I got to tell you, it, it sent the scribes into these orgasmic, just multi-orgasmic gossip fests where they were just envisioning all kinds of bigger trades coming down. Because if you think about it on its face, sending Sean Dursey to Arizona for a second round draft pick, it sounds like the Kings got screwed. Until you take a step back and then you look at the bigger picture. Because there's a couple of reasons. You're adding another asset, a draft pick, that you're probably not going to keep. You're getting Jersey's contract off the books, which is only 1.7 million. That's not a lot, but it keeps every trade that you make that opens up cap space, gives the Kings an opportunity to potentially fit a better player, a significantly better player to try and compete with either the Edmonton Oilers or the Vegas Golden Knights. We know the Kings need a goalie, for example. We also know that they've been kicking the tires on somebody who could eventually replace Andrzej Kopitar. Now, can that be done right now? Can it? Not sure. Here's why. After trading away Sean Dursey, the Kings have $9 million in salary cap space, which isn't really as much as it sounds. For example, they haven't re-signed Gabriel Velarde, a restricted free agent who had a terrific contract year. How much money would you have left over for an elite goaltender or a top six forward? Honestly, not that much. Not that much at all. So what does this mean? Is it possible that say you take another player on the Kings, add the draft pick that you got with Arizona, and use that contract for the player that you're trading away to create just enough cap space to not only sign Velarde, but possibly get a goalie. And I'm hinting at goalie. The scribes are going all in on getting a top six forward to eventually replace Andrzej Kopitar. But I'm here to tell you, I don't think I see it that way. I don't. The reason that I'm suggesting more goalie than top six forward, and I could be wrong, is because of Rob, the Kings GM is Rob Blake, who played defense. He played defense with the Kings as a young man when they didn't have solid goaltending. Then he played for Colorado, who had... Patrick Waugh, one of the game's all-time elite netminders. And then, of course, Rob Blake comes back to the Kings and he sees Jonathan Quick in net just dominating for a decade. So if you're Rob Blake, do you want the top six forward or do you think defensively like Rob Blake probably would? Again, he played defense. He knows the importance of having an elite netminder back there. Now, as for Dursey, he can help them being Arizona. Arizona, their GM is already calling him a, quote, reliable two-way defenseman, unquote. I will be honest, you lost me at reliable, but he is most definitely a two-way defenseman. But what this also does is it opens up a roster spot for uber prospect Brant Clark. 
Brant Clark only played a handful of games for the Kings last year. They couldn't allow him to continue to develop in the NHL because of the salary cap situation that I've been mentioning throughout this portion of the clip. So one way or another, as long as Brant Clark doesn't stink it up in training camp, and that's highly unlikely, you're not really losing much when you trade away Sean Dursey. It's not that he sucks, it's just that you have another elite prospect right there waiting to take a spot on the roster. So again, Sean Dursey to Arizona, the trade in and of itself looks like the Kings lose. But bigger picture, if they do in fact make a deal, whether for a top six forward or goalie, yeah, that's a necessary move to make the bigger win happen. Former Chargers running back Melvin Gordon blames Sean McVay for the bad free agent market for running backs. Uh, Gordon started off with the Chargers. He's also played a few years with Denver. Said Gordon, quote, after Todd Gurley got paid, and then Sean McVay came out and said, quote, I will never pay a running back again, unquote. I kind of think that's where everything just started going downhill. Of course, Gurley's jacked up knees didn't have anything to do with that being a bad contract. No, no, not at all. Not only the fact that Melvin Gordon hadn't been heard from ever since he left the Chargers, you have to think to remember that Melvin Gordon is still in the NFL in the first place for Pete's sake. So yeah, he's right in that the free agent market for running backs is bad. Just ask Gordon's replacement, Austin Eckler of the Chargers. But whose fault is that? Just because Sean McVay realized giving a big contract to a running back with bulky knees is a bad idea, that's not something you necessarily blame Sean McVay for. Pro Football Focus ranks the Rams secondary as the worst in the NFL. Which, honestly, can you really blame them for saying that? They may have as many as five new starters if they run out with a nickel defense as, as their primary base defensive backfield. Five brand new starters. And what is particularly troubling is Darian Kendrick. Darian Kendrick, according to PFF, was graded as the second worst cornerback in the entire league last year. Guess who is the most experienced Rams cornerback? Exactly, Darian Kendrick. So, kind of frightening when you think about it that way. It is possible that 60% of the Rams offensive line has been settled. We don't know necessarily which position, but we do believe we have an idea of three linemen who are gonna make the starting lineup. A beat writer jotted down the four best combinations that she saw during uh, off-season training activities. The three people in, uh, that should be on the roster or should be in the starting lineup, Alaric Jackson, Rob Havenstein, and rookie Steve Avila, because they were listed in all four of the best combinations. Scribes are also under the impression that Tutu Atwell has the lead for the number three receiver position, which in the Rams offense means he's a starter. Third year, people were expecting him to develop a little quicker, but yeah, probably a starter now. CBSSports.com believes Chargers center Corey Lindsley is one of the top 10 in interior offensive linemen of the NFL and arguably the game's best pass blocking center, which of course with Justin Herbert is an absolute necessity. The guy allowed no sacks last year. Now, yes, top 10 interior lineman, but why is he ranked number 10? because the Chargers can't block for the run. At least they couldn't last year. We'll see what happens with Kellen Moore's look at uh, running the ball this year. LAFC has extended a loan of midfielder Francisco Ganella to Nacional in Uruguay through June of next year. I, yeah, I realize that you're playing the sport you love, but man, having to, that just sounds like a punishment to me, dude. You should have trained harder when you were in the United States. That's all I can say. But you let me know what you think in the comments thread. Tell me how much you're loving the fact that the Astros think they got screwed. Tell me what you think is the next 
shoe to drop when the Kings make another deal in the off season. And if you enjoyed this content, don't forget to subscribe to Faithful Angelinos. We talk LA sports every single day here. Thank you for watching. I'm James. We'll be back tomorrow. Faithful Angelinos is a key on Corte El Queso production. Take care.